Hi, I'm Lynn Clark, and I'm a master's student at Derry, the Digital Enterprise Research Institute at the National University of Ireland in Galway, and I'm here to talk about the semantic web in Drupal. The semantic web can seem very confusing until you understand that it's based on very simple principles. I'm going to start talking about the benefits that you'll see from the semantic web, and then we can get into some of these very basic principles. So some of the benefits that you will see are that programs and sites can exchange information very easily. So for instance, say that you have a site and I have a site, and we work for the same company. And our company wants to keep information about both of us, but doesn't want to have to keep asking us about uh, if we, whether we've changed that information. They can just link to information on my site and link to information on your site. And whenever we update the information on our sites, whenever I update the information on my site or you update the information on your site, it will be automatically updated on the company site. Another benefit is that search engines can display more relevant information in search results. So um, you're already seeing this today uh, in Yahoo's Search Monkey or in Google Rich Snippets. You'll see um, some information such as reviews being pulled out into the actual search result. And they have shown that more people click on these results that have more information in them. So that's one great reason to include semantic web technologies in your sites. And another great thing is uh, data masters can combine data from different data sets to find new and astounding things. And I'm not just talking about the people that are doing things with Twitter and maps and stuff like that, that that's awesome stuff. But I'm also talking about scientists when I talk about data masters, people that take large amounts of data and try to make sense of it. The science community is actually very, very interested in the semantic web because it helps make sense of these large data sets. So uh, an example of some data sets that you could combine are for instance, weather data and stock market information. And you could take huge pools of information and combine them and say, oh, well, you know what? The stock market goes up when it's sunny and down when it's cloudy. Who knows? That, that could be something that um, actually is a, a real trend. Um, but when you can take these large amounts of data, you can find those, those trends that you never knew were there. So. I'm going to go over these key confusing terms now. Uh, I'm just going to give a brief overview of them before diving into them more deeply. Um, you have words like machine understandable, RDF, linked data, Sparkle, federated data sets, and giant global graph. Um, so I'll start off with machine understandable. The web that we have today was really designed for human consumption. Uh, if you take a web page, there are lots of visual cues, and when you look at the page, you can see there's two words that are next to each other, they're both capitalized, they're probably a name, and that is bigger than the rest of the things on the page, that means that this page is probably about the person who has that name. And there's a picture of a person very close to those two words, that probably is a picture of the person. And um, there's a Twitter logo over here and about 140 characters next to that. That's probably a tweet. And if you look further, you can probably figure out it's a tweet by this person. So that's a lot of information that you were able to figure out just from these context clues. Well, when a machine's looking at the information, it doesn't see these context clues. It just sees a bunch of characters and some images on a page. So what the semantic web does is it makes the web machine understandable. It makes it so that machines understand what the information on a web page is, like the fact that Lynn Clark is a name. And it also makes it so that the machine understands the relationships between different pieces of information on that page. Like lynnclark.jpg is a picture of a person named Lynn Clark. And it does that using the resource description framework or RDF. So what exactly is RDF? Well, RDF is a way of organizing information and it starts with a very basic principle. Everything is a resource. Everything's pretty much the same, it's all a resource. So what is a resource? Well, a resource is a named thing, it's something that you can talk about. So this could be a resource and, and we could give it a name, this. Well, that name isn't very helpful because when I say this, I could mean something very different from what you mean when you say this. So it's not just a named thing, but it's a uniquely named thing. 
And on the web, there's a really good way to uniquely name things, and that's by using URLs. So now I have a unique name for this thing. In the semantic web, we don't call these unique names URLs, we call them URIs, Universal Resource Identifiers, because they identify resources universally. And you might also see it written as an IRI, which is an international resource, internationalized resource identifier. Um, so we have this, this unique name, which is great, but it's also very long and hard to say out loud. So what we can do is we can compact that and we can go ahead and write it like this and then just say up in the top of our document when I say Lynn what I really mean is HTTP LynnClark.com etc 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 and so this is what's called a Curie or a compact URI so now I have all these resources I have all these things that I can have a conversation about that I can talk about and everyone will know exactly what I'm talking about because I'm using a universal identifier um, and that also means that two machines can have a conversation about this resource and they'll know that they're talking about the same thing because they're using this universal identifier so what exactly can we represent with these resources uh, there are lots of things. You can represent pretty, represent pretty much anything using a resource. Uh, you could represent a document. Um, you could represent a company. A resource can even be used to represent a person. And you'll see that there's a word that's been coming up next to each of these resources as, as I've been going through. Um, and that's what's called an RDF type. That gives a little bit more information about the resource. It says what kind of thing uh, you're, you're representing with this resource. And you'll notice that it looks very similar to the Curie that I had, um, the one that says Lin Me. Um, it has what's called a namespace prefix. And that's because Fof person is shorthand for a full URI. And when you go to the Fof person URI, when you, when you go to that page, you can actually see a description of what a Fof person is. And that's really helpful because that means I know when I'm using the term Fof person exactly what I'm representing and somebody else using the term Fof person is going to mean the same thing. So that's the benefit to using URIs and to having what are called dereferenceable URIs. So we used a RDF type to provide more information about this resource, but we can also say even more about this resource and really describe what it's like in real life. We can describe properties of the person, like their name, their email address, their birthday. And you can also describe how the person is related to other resources, like in this instance that the company employs the person who wrote this paper. And because we're using HTTP URIs, these resources don't need to be in the same database. Uh, they can be fetched over the web. Um, they can be distributed across the web in what's called a federated data graph. And that's what people mean when they talk about federated data sets. Um, they're um, data sets that are in different places, that have data in different places all over the web. And when you get all resources described this way, the web kind of becomes one giant database where you're describing all sorts of things um, that are all over the web and the connections between them. And that is what is meant when people talk about the giant global graph. It's this big database in the sky where everyone, everything is related to one another and um, we know properties of those things, we know their types, and, and the kinds of relationships. And the great thing about this giant global graph is that you can query the graph kind of like you do right now with views um, and using SQL. Um, so I could say I want to 
find out some things about dairy. Say I'm actually building the website for dairy and I want to have all of the publications that anybody that works at dairy uh, has published. I want to have them all on one page. I could either try and hunt down all of the people and have them tell me whenever they publish something new or I could query the graph for all of the people that have a relationship, an employee relationship with dairy and then query those for their publications. And whenever somebody were to update their publications page on their site, it would automatically get updated on the dairy site as well. So do you query the graph using SQL? No, you query it using Sparkle, which is a specific query language for RDF.